Hello, this is Victoria Yurkova, and today Art in Adelaide is visiting Andrew Baines in his beautiful studio, and we are going to have a good chat about art and maybe something else. Hi, Andrew, how are you? Good, thank you, yes. Andrew, I would like to start our interview from the question which buzzes in my mind since the day when we filmed you at Henley Beach during your event uh, when you put together about the hundred of sausage dogs and their owners. Yeah. It was so unreal and so interesting and such fun. I would like to ask uh, what uh, influenced you uh, to organize such an event and how did you encourage people to participate in? So about 10 years ago, I was down the beach on my own and I saw a little sausage dog running along the water's edge. And next year, this big Labrador came and flattened him squash them into the ground and then I turned around and nobody cared. I think the sausage dog needs a bit of marketing to build them up, give them a bit of profile, a bit of status in the world. And so I thought, I tried to work out what I'd do. So I started painting sausage dog paintings and then I thought, I don't know what, I'm going to take the sausage dog painting off the canvas, I'm going to give it life, and I'm going to invite hundreds of people to bring their sausage dogs down to the beach and we'll march them along with music and suddenly they'll have a bit of hierarchy and they'll become influencers and they'll, when the sausage dog eventually gets knocked over again, people think, oh no, you can't do that, they're, they're important animals. And um, yeah, people really embrace the concept and so I contacted the Sausage Dog Association, I told them what they were doing and I said, you've got to wear suits so it looks very regal and smart and people just loved it. And we had about 200 sausage dogs marching on the beach and then the media jumped on board and then it just took off and people around the world were having sausage dog marches through parks. And then there was sausage dog guinea book records. It was just, it got, it didn't get out of hand. It just became quite incredible. It's good. And also, as I know, you organized another extravagant art event when you put in the ocean a real herd of cows. Oh yeah. Uh, alongside with their owners. Yeah, no, so what happened was over in West Australia, I was at the opening of my exhibition and I had quite a few cow paintings. And it just turns out at Bustleton they're having an international cow conference. And this woman that was organizing it, she came to me and said, would you like to hang your cow paintings in the um, hall there at the um, lodge? And I said, yeah, so that's good. It's a bit boring now. I said, what about we get real cows and put them in the ocean? I said, I'm sure your delegates from around the world will be much more interested in that. And she, and she looked at me as if I was mental. And so, <laughs> and so I thought, nothing's going to come from this. And then two days later, I get a phone call from the Holstein in Australia. And they said, we want to put cows in the ocean and we're going to start training them now. And so three months down the track, we met them at Buston Beach and they all rocked up in these big trucks and they detailed the cows because they knew the cows we've seen around the world and they're very super critical. And we put the cows in the ocean and they actually loved it. And then the hundred odd delegates came down, they took all photos and it was just an incredible thing. And um, I fell in love with cows that day. <laughs> And the cows went, it was just, it was just amazing. And uh, I've just gone on from there then. I've put cows in the water all over the countryside. Even uh, Double Bay in Sydney, mm. we had to get all the rich people to say, to agree to it. No, cows are fantastic. Yeah, so, and did you use uh, the photograph you took uh, that time for your, like, references yeah. to your paintings? Yeah, so I definitely did that, because that was part of the marketing of it. So people would want to come and see their own cows. It wasn't done as a marketing venture but it ended up being one of my most exciting and interesting and most profile things. It even got featured on um, um, American TV programs. Oh, really? Yeah, it was incredible. Because it was so bizarre and so unique, all the media came down. There was more media than cows and cow handlers. And Andrew, uh, why uh, this gentleman in black office suit uh, is walking in the water? What... Uh yeah. Did you mean and how did you got this idea? So this was, um, I mentioned earlier about my dad took me back to London to visit the relatives and one morning he took me on the London Underground and we walked down onto the platform and there was like hundreds of people dressed like that with briefcases and I thought it was a movie or some advert but my dad said no this is um, the corporate badger they're going off their 9 to 5 grind and when they reach 65 they'll be given a gold watch and they'll drop dead. And so when I came back to Australia, I started thinking about it. 
and then when I started becoming a painter I thought I can release these people from their horrid existence and put them in our Australian beaches to enjoy it and um, the first painting I did it sold straight away and people there was a real buzz about it and people were saying I think you're onto something really big and then from then on it just got more and more incredible and then I thought I'll take it off a canvas and I'll give it life and so I put an advert in the paper wanted business people to stand in the ocean and I thought nobody would turn up but over 100 people came down there oh, really? and I gave them bowl hats and we lined them all up and the local media came and within like two days I was famous around the world it was incredible like I went on to um, YouTube and all this sort of thing and there was every story was about me putting in these business people in the ocean and then on the strip of just went right around Australia doing it and as I went along I had prime ministers and governors and all sorts of high profile people coming in and it was sort of like the biggest promotion of my career ever and then I just kept evolving and evolving you know then I went to cows and I put archbishops in the ocean I can't even remember the amount of things I've done but everything one of them has been fantastic and really well embraced but you know a good part of society anyway some people think I'm crazy but it's a good way of, be, of being crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, and it's a financial way of being crazy. Why ocean? Do you have some, like, personal connection oh, to water? Or? Yeah, because I spent my whole life living at Grange Beach. And so every day I either went fishing, running, swimming, um, drawing. So everything, that's like a homage to my lifestyle is having the beach in the background. Obviously, I do a few different things, but the bulk of my paintings are to do with the beach because I know it so well. Like I can paint the ocean without even looking at it or using any reference. So yeah, the beach is my heartland. Yeah, and did you start uh, painting, drawing or, as a child or oh, it yeah. happened later? No, no, um, from the moment my mum gave me a pencil I was drawing. So I, I knew from the moment I could think I was an artist. I just knew I was an artist. There was no, no, no two ways about it. And um, yeah, and because I was so positive and confident, things just kept coming my way. Like I was selling sketches when I was six and seven to school teachers. I don't know, if you've got the right attitude and you believe in yourself, things just come. They just keep coming, coming. I don't think it's good luck. I think it's you're setting out these vibes. But when you're not sure and you think, oh, I don't know if I, I can be an artist, or I'm not sure if I'm going to make enough money. But when you honestly believe that's part of who you are, the, the world embraces you. It's quite interesting. So, so it started from the first pencil? Yeah. It's amazing. And do you normally just paint or you do some drawing? Uh, or? Every painting has like about five or six sketches for it. But I don't actually draw, I just sketch. Sketching. I'm always just doing, you know, like little ideas. I used to draw, but it, it sort of bores me. I'd rather paint. And uh, which media do you use? Uh, just acrylics. acrylics. Yeah. And don't you try another ones? I used to use oils, but I, I found it too smelly and too time consuming. I like acrylics because it's a bit healthier, I think. And also, I can get paints out very quickly. Mm -hmm. like, uh, because it dries quick. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> like, especially in this weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. As I understood, uh, you paint mostly in surrealistic genre? Yeah. And uh, the question is, why this genre and what inspires you for your <clears throat> paintings? Humanity and society bores me. Like, I hate the fact that people, their the whole life is about getting married, going to the football, having children. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great. And I embrace it myself, but I just think there's much, much more to life. And I, I can see all the excitement and all the great things. And I don't want to, I don't want to go down that mundane passage, I want to go different areas. So if I see a beautiful ocean, of course I love it, all the colours, the azures and the sky, but I think there's got to be something extra there. There's got to be something in there which makes people think and takes it to another perspective. Because people get so caught up in that premeditated lifestyle of, I don't want a life like that. I want to know that every day I could possibly get a phone call from some cow farmer saying, can you come out now? We want our cow painted. Or can you come and help us um, come up with some sort of big surreal installation which is going to make people stop and think about our charity or our organisation? That's what's happened. All my f past cow and business people things have turned into corporate events and now I get hired by, not hired, I get employed by charities and things like that and the United Nations, I'm the UN advisor 
because I know that I've got an ability to make people stop and think. It's like when they had a big issue about microplastics. And so I studied it and it turns out there's nothing we can really do. We can't turn back the amount of rubbish that's in the ocean. So I had a funeral on the beach and we had 200 people and we had a fake priest who gave a eulogy and all the people had top hats on. And to look at it was quite morbid and a bit shocking, but how else do you bring it to people's attention unless you shock them a little bit and show them a surreal version of what's happened. So it's not just about painting, it's about your vision of yeah. life in general. Yeah. It makes your life even more interesting and the life of the people who participate, yeah. participate the, in your activities. Yeah, the problem is, activities. the majority of people will, maybe 50% of people look at what I'm doing think, this bloke, he's crazy, you know, what's wrong with him? But at the same time they're starting to think a little bit, why is he doing that? And so it's sort of already changing their outlook on life. And like my wife said, she found this um, website dedicated to what an idiot I am. Like hundreds of people had put in all these things saying, why is this bloke doing this rubbish? Like why is he putting plastic sausage dogs on top of a roof of a shop and all sorts of things? But I thought that's fantastic that it's got to the point where people are so pissed off about it that they want to dedicate a website. <laughs> I love it when people come into the galleries and they look at my work and say, this is ridiculous. Andrew, oh. um, why did you put this uh, iconic Australian clothesline on the beach? Did you have some message? Yeah, it's about high density living and about um, all these big um, multi-storey places and families having to live in one room and have no backyard because the Aussie backyard was a famous thing that everybody had when I was a youngster. And so now people are having to use public spaces to enjoy theirself and so I went the extra yard and said that mum was hanging her washing out on the beach instead of in the backyard and then on the strip of that I contacted Hills Hoist and I said this is a painting I do, I want to do this for real on Bondi Beach, I want to have eight Hills Hoist and I want to have mums hanging their washing out and I thought they'd think oh no but they got straight back to me and said yep yeah, we'll meet you at Bondi Beach, we'll have installers for you and you can tell us where you want all the Hills Hoist put up and so it's incredible, I got there at 4 o'clock in the morning, they had the trucks there, they, I was like one of those mums wanting all the house arranged, and I was like one, one here, one there, and then all these mums came down and hung their washing out, and as people woke up in the morning head onto the beach, the whole beach was full of hill source, and um, that got incredible publicity. Um, did you have some support from other people, like uh, uh, that encourage you to keep doing, I know that you would yeah. Do it anyways, but uh, do well, my, receive this support from yeah, my uh, big support is my people. wife because it's, it's a great story, really. So, what happened was I was doing mainly commercial art, murals, and cartoons, and we had two kids in a house. And every night I'd paint and do my surreal stuff, and my wife would come out and talk to me and always say, I want to give this up. I want to be a real artist. I want to have exhibitions. And she said, well, You can't. You know, we've got kids, we've got bills. You know, and um, and then after about ten years, she came out one night and she goes, um, um, she said, I want you to give up and chase this dream because I believe in you. Like you know, it was like a turning point in my life where yeah. I was able to then fully do exactly what I wanted with the support of my family, even though I made them struggle badly. It, um, it was a fantastic turning point because without the backing of your family. You can't really go on, can you? Yeah. yeah. So it uh, does not happen like straight away that you became a full-time artist. So. Oh, I was a, a full-time artist as in I was doing murals, cartoons, selling sketches. But to move in, I wasn't until I was like 28, 29 before I started doing this sort of stuff, which was still quite early. But um, yeah, because it... Everything I had to do had to make money to pay for the kids and pay for the bills and the house. And did you uh, like formally studied art before oh, yeah. you? Yeah, I went to the Saffron School of Art for two years, but um, yeah, the, I, I actually didn't enjoy it. I didn't enjoy how they taught, even though it was great and so many people have done so many incredible things, it wasn't my way. And so after a couple of years I pulled out and I just went my own direction. But I did have a great art teacher, as in this chap, his name was Gary Gaston, and he used to be the president of the Art Society. And he was in charge of um, art at, this, at John Martin's retail store. And he taught me how to paint, and which was really kind of him, and that was what gave me my base. Yeah. 
So did you get some like practically used uh, skills from this study? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, definitely, yeah. So do you like more techniques or whatever? Oh yeah. Um, I actually it was more about you. They giving you the encouragement to believe in what you want to do, rather than give you a formula, which I thought it was good. You know, so it's really about tapping into a lot of different mediums and genres, and then you see which what you like, and that's the direction you take, rather than giving you a formula, which is not what you want to be. If you want to be an artist, you want to be different, don't you? Did you uh, meet some like serious obstacles, which could be met by other beginning uh, beginners artists? No, I've never, everything's, I've been really, really lucky. I'm a very lucky person. <laughs> I don't know why. Everything seemed to, magical things happen to me. I don't know how to get it. I think because, you know what I reckon, because I give so much to charity. Because like 20% of my paintings I give to charity. And then all these incredible things happen to me. Like, like when I went to Singapore for my first solo exhibition, by pure chance, Landline Australia had <coughs> distributed my story about me doing cow paintings throughout Asia. And the night before my opening, it came on TV, on Singapore TV. And so when I went to the exhibition the next day, there was like 20 people lined up wanting cow paintings. And um, it just seems so. Uh, I'm just very, very fortunate. It sounds like if you give a lot, you yeah. like receive a lot, like oh, from so many people. from somewhere. Yeah, it's, I've, it's like, um, magic. This big charity, this is about, this is when the GFC, 2008 GFC, and all the galleries were going broke and people were struggling, and I was struggling. And this charity came to me, they said, can you help us create an event and then we'll do some paintings and auction them off. And I said, yeah, I'd love to, but I've got no money, I'm broke. And they said, we'll pay for everything. And um, so we created this big event on the beach and we made $60,000 and then we, I did free paintings and they sold those to people like Santos and that sort of thing. And then after um, I was sitting down, this woman came up to me, she was beautifully dressed, and she said, um, I want to put $5,000 in your account. I said, what for? This is charity. She goes, no, no. She says, I know what you're going through. And so I told my wife, she said, take the money, you idiot, we're broke. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, I get a phone call from the PA of the charity's ambassador, and they said, what do you want? I go, what do you mean, what do I want? You've already given me $5,000, which I didn't expect. They said, no, we want to give you some marketing. And so I jokingly said, I want to be in the financial review. And then a day later, I got a phone call from the editor, and he goes, you must have some very powerful friends because we're giving you a free page spread in the Saturday financial review. And that weekend, every painting everywhere sold. I, had, I got inundated with queries from all over um, Asia. It was just incredible. And it was all because um, I um, helped them with this charity, which was obviously something they really wanted and really needed. And... Uh, yeah, it's incredible what happens. Yeah. It's even more fascinating than Cinderella's story. Oh, it is. It's just... It's amazing. Yeah, and, um, but it's like I said, I just keep giving and giving because I really love it. I get more pleasure out of a charity auction and my painting going for some massive price and knowing that I've really contributed. It feels great. Yeah. Then just selling a painting is fantastic, but not a lot of the feeling you get when you know you're helping a big community of people. What is your advice for the young artists who would like to be full-time artists yeah. but have no idea how, how and what to start from? Well, what you have to do is, well, I learned, you have to develop a style, you have to develop a way of painting that you know people appreciate. Just keep pushing it and pushing it. Like when I was painting, you just went to galleries, but now you've got social media, so you can show your work internationally and get a, it's a good stepping stone. But you just got to just persevere and persevere and never give up. And it's like a numbers game. It's like door-to-door -door salesmen. Every time they knock on a door, they know getting closer to that one door that will say yes. And that's the same with me. I used to just send hundreds and hundreds of these letters and photos to all these galleries around the world. And I didn't care because I knew that one or two would get back. And they always did. It's just a waiting game and a numbers game. But that's life in general, I think. And it's really hard to say that, though, because like, you've got to earn money, but sometimes you've got to put money to the side if it's not the big dream. You know what I mean? Sometimes you have to struggle a bit. Like, I struggled for five years and really struggled, but it turned around eventually. And just to follow your dream. Yeah, you just got to keep pushing keep and going. pushing and believing and believing and never... And the best bit is when somebody says to you, you can't do it, that's when you know 
that you are starting to do it because people are very good at what people do is when you first start out, they start knocking you and knocking you, but when they see you're starting to make it, then they jump on board. So when you know when people are knocking you that you're on the right path, and because you know eventually they'll come on board and that's when you know you're starting to really make it. People just seem to want to knock each other. I don't know why, because they, because if you start to make progress and it makes them look smaller, so there's all these little signals that are happening that appear quite negative, but actually means that you're on the path to success. I recognize, mm. I think it's uh, Henry Jetty, isn't it? That's right. And so, does it mean that this lady belongs to Henley Bowling Club? That's exactly right. And what do they do on the beach? Are they washed away or what's well, happened? Well, actually what's happened is this is how they used to dress. They used to be called white leghorns. And, but in the last few years they've gotten more colourful and more more media friendly. So they look like a cricket team rather than the old fashioned bowling. And I've always loved the that beautiful, fresh, feminine white. And it's just, it was enhanced by the beach and the fact that this is a Henley Jetty, so it is, yeah, it, the actual time is being washed away. But I'm gonna bring it back in a quirky sort of comical way. I hope they feel comfortable in the water. Oh. Same as your cows. Yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> yeah, the cows love it. I don't know, I suppose they would, <laughs> if it didn't go too deep. Yeah, yeah. I hope they're okay. Yeah. You have quite um, unusual and quite recognizable style. Uh, did you always paint in this style or it's changed? Well, um, as I said before, um, Gary Gasson, he, he used to teach me traditional painting. He was a traditional artist. I started out like that and I quite loved it, but somehow my style evolved. It became more modern, more contemporary. It just keeps evolving continually and the colors change and they go really pale, they go really dark. But I think that's to do with where I am in my life, emotionally. And I just let it go. And people will say, I don't like your style anymore. But I think, oh, there's nothing I can do about it because I want to see where this is going. And um, my work is becoming more modified at the moment. But then eventually it might go very refined again or it might go dark. It's really quite exciting to see what's happening in your body come out in your art. That's how you know a real artist, <coughs> because you see them evolve, whereas some people just, they find their niche, <coughs> they know they sell, so they just stick with it, mm -hmm. which I think is like a waste of life. Does someone try to walk in your style or copy <coughs> your style? Of course, yeah, yeah. You see that all the time. But um, people know who the real person is. Well, you hope so. <laughs> but what, I, I think it's impossible to stop plagiarism. But people will accuse me of plagiarism because my work is similar to other artists like Jeffrey Smart or Magritte. And, um, but it's not. I've got my own inspiration, but they overlap. And just because somebody's on the other side of the world doesn't mean they're not going to have the same thought as you. And that's another thing you'll find. You'll go online and you think you've come up with the greatest idea, but somebody's already come up with it. And that's just the way human nature is. We're all going through the same things, but in different parts of the world. So why wouldn't you think of the same ideas? What do you think uh, if you know that someone just copy your works and... Uh... Oh, yeah. Well, if it's, a, if it's somebody who's doing one off like an artist, there's nothing you can really do and you think, oh, whatever. But if it's like a major printing company, which happened to me in Singapore and China, then I've got my lawyers onto it. But at the same time, it's actually great marketing. And also the fact that they're doing a mass production of your work means you obviously got to a level where you're worth doing reproduction. So some, some ways you think just let them go because especially if you're in a place like China which you're going to get to anyway and then these Chinese are going to have to come to Singapore to buy your work but at the end of the day you think oh, I, I should stop it really because you don't know where it's going to go to. It's a very interesting problem to have and also it's good for your ego. <laughs> so it's a, a bit, maybe a bit personal question but it's really interesting. What ways do you use to sell your works? Uh, just uh, oh. It's through galleries, because I've got galleries all over the world. They sell them, they have the great database. Um, social media is fantastic. Like I think, for me, Instagram is the best. And um, Facebook's quite good, but Facebook's more about my stupidity and the dumb things I think about. It's more entertaining for me. But uh, Instagram is just pure images and a little bit of writing. And, um, and obviously, if you can get it in the newspapers or on TV or on the news, it's all great, it all overlaps, it all just keeps building and building. It's like a groundswell, and then eventually you're just overrun with people contacting you, and that's what I've got to now. I've got to the point where I just can't keep up anymore. 
So I just paint. I just <laughs> do my six to seven hours a day and just hope that people don't mind waiting that long for a painting. And generally they don't mind. Yeah. And do you participate in exhibition auctions or...? I have my two exhibitions a year around Australia, some overseas, and art auctions has been an incredible thing because it's like the best credibility because they produce beautiful catalogues. My paintings are along the side of famous artists like Blackman and Boyd, and they do great stories about your work. And people that invest into art are generally quite well off. And so suddenly your, your credibility rises, the paintings prices rise. And like a painting, it's quite incredible. A painting that was sold for eight and a half grand here, like this, at auction can get up to 25 grand if you get a couple of real furious bidders because a lot of that is ego, but then a lot of the bidding's online anyway, so you don't know who you're bidding against. But our auction has just been amazing. I have nothing to do with whatsoever. You know, I just don't, I don't know anything about it, I don't know any of the people, I just know that it's benefiting me. And then suddenly I'll get phone calls and people will come from interstate, from Sydney and Melbourne, and whatever's on the easel, they'll buy. It's just incredible. Thank you, Andrew, for your interesting story story uh, I learned so much from it and I yeah. think that it will be interesting for everyone thank you yeah thank you <laughs>